Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's In the Artist Studio. This is the last In the Artist Studio of 2020. We did it. We made it. Um, I'm Elena Gross, the Curatorial Manager of Exhibitions and the Emerging Artists Program at MOAD. And it's my pleasure today to be speaking and touring in virtual space with San Francisco-based artist Cheryl Derricott. Um, before we get to the conversation, I just want to go through a few housekeeping things. As I mentioned to um, many of you who have already joined us, but if you're just joining us now, please write in and tell us where you're joining us from. MOAD's physical building may be closed due to the mandatory shelter in place, but you can still get your fill of art and artists of the African diaspora each Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard. Join MOAD staff members like myself as we visit some of our favorite artists in their studios to see what they're currently working on and how their work is changing as a result of the quarantine. This is a rare opportunity to hear from artists directly from their studios. We will follow all talks with an audience Q&A, so please feel free to leave your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box at any point um, during the talk today. And please visit our website to see which artists we have coming up. You can also go back and watch all of our past talks on the MOAD YouTube channel. This series was made possible by generous donations from the Westridge Foundation, our wonderful MOAD members, and viewers like you. Thank you for all of your continued support. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and Breonna Taylor, and so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. Most, we would also like to give a land acknowledgement. Most of us are settler immigrants or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent. Our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose land we are located. With deep respect, MOAD acknowledges that even in virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are on native lands, and we thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Lastly, if you have been enjoying this series or any MOAD programming, which we have done over 150 programs um, since quarantine started, wow. outrageous, um, please consider donating to MOAD online. Donate, donations of any amount are always welcome. The link to where you can donate will be in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's featured artist, Cheryl Derricott. Cheryl is a visual artist and her favorite mediums are glass and paper. Originally from Washington, DC, she lives and makes art in San Francisco, California. She has an extensive background in the arts and community development. Cheryl holds the, Master, the Master's of Fine Arts from the California Institute of Integral Studies, the Master of Regional Planning from Cornell University and a BA in Urban Affairs from Barnard College, Columbia University. Recent awards include the Villa San Francisco French Consulate Micro Residency, Vermont Studio Center Residency, and Tenet Paper Machine Residency, San Francisco Individual Artist Commission and the Puffin Foundation Grant. She is also the recipient of the Himera Foundation Tending Space Fellowship for Artists, the Rick and Val Beck Scholarship for Glass, Emerging Artists at the Museum of the African Diaspora, yes. uh, Garter Center Fellow, Art Alliance for Contemporary Glasses Visionary Scholarship, and a DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities National Endowment of, for the Arts Artist Fellowship Grant. Cheryl is an active thought leader in the arts. In 2020, she served as the secretary, AKA the Minister of Information for 3.9 Art Collective, a group of black artists who live and make in San Francisco. She is also the chief mindfulness officer of Crux, a nationwide cooperative of black artists working at the intersection of art and technology through immersive storytelling. Cheryl is also a founding member of Collective Genus, a group of Bay Area artists working across media and subject matter, but united by common goals and a commitment to the greater arts community. Last but not least, Cheryl is the creator of the Society of Brave Artists, an interview series on Instagram highlighting contemporary political art. Um, and that, uh, hat, that will be thrown in the chat as well. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Elena. And hello to everyone from Moad and all the people um, both on Zoom and Facebook. I'm so glad you could join us this lunchtime. Yeah, I'm so glad we were able to have you on the program. Obviously, you were one of our former emerging artists and therefore always part of Moad's extens extended family. And so we're always happy to be able to um, catch up with you and see what you're working on. Thank you. Happy to be here. So just to start things off, um, would you mind showing, well, first tell us a little bit about um, your studio space that you're in right now. And if you are so inclined, show us around for a little bit. Totally. So um, 
I am actually on residency. Um, I'm so excited to have a five week residency from This Will Take Time. And they created um, an Oakland residency targeted to um, black, indigenous, people of color, artists. Um, and so I'm actually for five weeks in a shipping container in Oakland. And it's so cool because I always thought I would love shipping containers. And that's why we have the headset on to cut the echo down. But I'll give you a little tour. So as you see out the window, somebody has wow. their container open, um, the pizza parlor on the corner. And it's one long space, which is awesome. Um, and it gives me wall space, which is something I really wanted to work on. And so a lot of times when I'm doing my computer work, I sit at this nice little desk and the former artist in residence here left this beautiful plant and keeping it alive it looks great yes i'm keeping that plant alive we love the plant and then <laughs> another artist um had left some fresh sage which i let dry and some cups so i have actually already ordered a present but i won't spoil the surprise for the artist who comes after me january 9th and then there is although it's been quite cold um there is a lovely courtyard here. Mm. So you can come out and have tea, have a little drink. Yeah, have a little snack. So it's nice. And so, yeah. yeah. And just as I'm walking and we'll get into the piece a little more, but people can see why I wanted some wall space to work on some police brutality work and mm. scale it up a bit. So what have your studio spaces been like uh, typically before um, you got this, you know, this opportunity to be at this residency? Mm -hmm. I've always been in warehouses, um, particularly for glass. So when I first came to the Bay Area, um, I was in Oakland. I lived in Oakland for five years. So it's really fun to be back in the town, albeit only for a month. Um, and my studio used to be in the old American Steel before that. Building. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I was in American Steel. And um, when I moved to San Francisco, um, which actually was shortly after I was um, a Moed emerging artist, I relocated into Yosemite Place Studios in the Bayview um, mm. because that's the space in San Francisco that is still okay with those of us who use equipment. So there are other glass mm -hmm. artists in that building, woodworkers, ceramicists. Yeah, there are a number of glass artists in the Bayview as well, right? There's another, um, there's a glass blowing, I think there's a glass studio in the Bayview, right? Yeah. Yes, so that studio is on the other side of the same <laughs> warehouse complex. Oh, okay. Yep, mm -hmm. public glass is what sort of you would go around the block, mm -hmm. but it's like a huge connecting set of warehouses. And then we're actually um, just off of Third Street on Yosemite Avenue on that side of the building. So outside of obviously this residency, do you have, are there um, other residencies or other exhibitions or um, coming up? Have you had, you said uh, we, you know, we mentioned a little bit earlier how your calendar as everyone's has has shifted kind of greatly. What has the last few months um, kind of in quarantine been like for you and for your practice? Yeah, it, it's definitely been a huge shift. Um, so in terms of residencies, I was really fortunate not only to get this residency, but also earlier in the year to have a micro residency at Villa San Francisco for one week. Um, and, you know, that was a surprise and a great delight as well. And I actually lived on site for a week. Um, which was really nice. Um, my practice really has been more on the paper side of things under quarantine, mm -hmm. as opposed to the glass side of things, yeah. mainly because of needing to shelter and control, you know, my right. environment to the best of my ability. Um, the building where my glass studio is, is like, you know, a very large multi-level warehouse lots of people with lots of opinions and different choices. 
about all the things, including masks. And yeah. so, you know, my actual studio mates um, are really great, you know, but it was definitely broader concerns that led me to kind of say, okay, how can you hunker down for a while and continue to make work outside of glass? Right. Do you enjoy working in community um, normally? Has this been really challenging being uh, kind of isolated in a certain way? Um, you know, yes and no. I mean, I would say the isolation part is just sort of getting out and seeing mm -hmm. people, you know, um, I miss like people stopping by my studio or stopping by their studio, you know, much less getting together with people easily for coffee or lunch or that type of thing, right. which has all, you know, kind of gone away. Um, I feel like, you know, as an artist in many ways, like the pandemic is perfect for us because if you push too many artists anyway, they'd much rather be alone in the studio <laughs> with their head down yeah. or like with a book. So, right. you know, in that sense, I feel like I've been thriving, you know, which is really <laughs> great. You know, um, it's been the broader concerns that right. I think have brought the stress, you know, the public yeah. health challenge of the pandemic and the twin pandemic of racism in America. Of course, yeah. Well, let's jump into some of your work. Um, so I'm gonna pull up on my screen um, a few images and then we'll go through. Okay, great. So I wanna kind of start by um, you know, talking to you a little bit about how you arrived in the Bay Area. Um, so you're originally from Washington, D.C., and a lot of your work, it seems, it feels like there's a connective bridge between the East Coast and the West Coast and thinking about um, thinking about that kind of migration, ultimately, um, mm -hmm. of, of Black folks from on either side of the country. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you see um, locale and location as being important to the work that you do. Sure, thanks. I mean, I think home is always one of my central values, you know, and to the extent that home is wherever we all are, um, I don't think of home just exclusively as my homeland mm -hmm. of DC. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot about the studio that is home for me. Um, I've certainly been fortunate that the Bay Area has become a home for me through my artist community, including, you know, folks you mentioned like Collective Genus and mm -hmm. 3.9. Um, I think that, you know, as a, as a person who also has worked in like the real estate space, I think place is something that has always been on my mind um, and carried through you know, working in day jobs and community development and more recently creative placemaking in the tech sector. Mm -hmm. um, so place is definitely important to me. And so uh, I think, so part of the reason that I wanted to start with this particular work of yours in thinking about that is thinking about the history of place as well and how that, um, how that comes up a lot in your work and thinking, of, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the project that you're currently um, working on around Thomas Jefferson. Sure. So the work on the screen is actually called The Wolf and the Scale. And it has a quote by Thomas Jefferson. He used to, um, he actually said it more than once in conversations with people around slavery. Um, and it basically says, you know, we have the wolf by the ear it's ne neither safe to hold him nor to let him go. Justice is in one hand, self-preservation is in the other. And the wolf was his metaphor for the institution of slavery. And so, you know, on the one hand, you think of Thomas Jefferson as this person that was very committed to sort of ideals of freedom when it came to the US or the French Revolution, but that really didn't extend to black people. And so when I had the opportunity 
um, to take on the micro residency at Villa SF through this curatorial series um, called Hatch that Re Riddle Gallery developed. I was just right away thinking, oh, I should make some work about Thomas Jefferson. Um, a lot of my process is really intuitive. So I just listened to the curator Candace Huey's sort of statement about what she was thinking. And then when she was done, I just said, I'm just really getting a hit on Thomas Jefferson. And so I started looking into um, some of his writings, a little more about um, the Hemings family, particularly Sally Hemings and her older brother, James, um, because James was the person that actually went with Jefferson first to France and trained as chef de cuisine. I think we may have got a, she may have lost Wi-Fi. Oh no. Let's see, did a link. Oh, there she oh, is. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. Yeah, you cut out a little bit there, but um, the last thing I heard was chef de cuisine. Yes, yes. So um, Sally Hemings' older brother, James, trained as a French chef de cuisine so that when Thomas Jefferson came home to Monticello, he could have the same French cuisine he enjoyed while he was overseas. Um, and so, you know, in taking on this work, as part of the residency, it was also an opportunity for me to connect to contemporary events because a lot of people really didn't put together that Charlottesville, which was the site of the recent horrific race ride, is literally like, you know, 10, 15 minutes from Monticello. Um, so it was just an opportunity for me to make some connections about why we're still having these huge problems with racism in the US. So it seems like um, with this work and then the, uh, the work that you have at the De Young, which we'll also show in a, in a moment as well, um, a lot of your work is kind of concerned with the representation of history and data and fact, um, these things that we we accept without, we often accept without question or that are positioned as having this very authoritative objective nature. Um, whereas it feels like you're using, would you say it's fair to say that you're using visual language as a means of sort of um, like exposing, exposing kind of the fallacy to objectivity around this information um, and manipulating kind of this prescriptive data? Yes, I mean, I think that's a perfect way to look at it, you know, for me, it's it's a different way of saying, don't know your past, don't know your future. And so mm -hmm. to the extent that a lot of times we just sort of accept things as the way they are, or at best we know like a surface level of the story, but not a deeper truth about the story. Um, you know, I use a lot of my artwork to facilitate that. I always say that, you know, art's a really great and brave space to have difficult conversations. So I see what I do as being a stand for art and liberation and a way for us as a society to take on these things within the construct of art. And how did how did these themes, I guess, begin to emerge in your work? Did you did you have a background in history or sociology, or did they kind of emerge from just general interest? Um, I think there's something really important about an, being an artist and using this information um, and and telling these narratives through through visual art as opposed to through something that is more fact driven. And so I was just wondering how how the two kind of came together for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. That's a great question. And nobody's ever asked me that. I actually minored in history mm. when I was an undergrad um, at Barnard College, Columbia University. And my internship for like three years during my undergrad was at the Schomburg Center for Research oh, in yeah. Black Culture. Yeah. And so I did... Um, a lot of really interesting research. Um, one professor that I worked with um, did a lot of work around the black intelligentsia and was publishing historical monographs on you know, the great thinkers like Du Bois and others. 
Um, and then I also worked for another professor that did sort of the first critical biography on James Vanderzee and his mm -hmm. work. Um, and so, you know, I really, I think those were probably the early days of me starting to have an understanding of text and image mm -hmm. and a relationship to history. Um, and it was certainly, you know, a wonderful time to be at Schaumburg. I mean, you know, Debbie Willis was running the photography department mm -hmm. at that time. We used to get to go to programs and like see Gordon Parks when he came oh, wow. to talk at the main library. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing space. Um, and I think my own interest in history um, was, you know, really still connected to place. I mean, my degree ended up being in urban affairs, mm -hmm. um, but it was such a time of heightened activism around mm -hmm. divestment, um, a lot of early anti-racist campaigns on campus that I felt very connected to wanting to know more about history and the history of activism and art. So I also, I feel now, actually I wanna move to, to this work here okay. in particular because I think there's a way in which you're now kind of looking at what we might be considered more like algorithmic data in certain ways in some of the work that you're doing now. So it feels like there's a nice translation from um, from kind of the Schomburg Center, you know, this more analog way of uh, approaching history to now a very, you know, techn technologically focused way of looking at data and presenting it. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could talk, you know, you you began to talk a bit about all of your different, the different, um, the different collectives you're a part of, the different um, groups you're a part of that are at the intersection of art and technology and then also activism, which is also, I see very much at the intersection of art and technology as well. And so it feels like you're kind of merging all of these things in your practice. And this particular this particular work that you're doing um, with this project feels kind of in line with that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this and then the work you have just behind you on the wall, which I'm assuming is related. Yes. So what I'll do, and actually I should have moved around as the light very kindly went out uh, for environmental concerns, which is wonderful. I will um, show you this piece. This is like, and I think, you know, it's always good for people when you're in the studio, people always say, well, how did you make this or how did it happen? So this was the draft piece of the work that ended up being in the De Young. So this is the original at a glance calendar and you see the bullets. And so part of when I made that initial piece, you know, part of what I was starting to think about was like how to represent that data and then also just starting to look at scale. And so ultimately, you know, the final piece, um, which is in the De Young Open and Oh, and I guess now I can, I can tell everybody because I said it on Instagram and the DeYoung acquired this piece. So oh, it's going to <laughs> stay. Thank you. It's going to stay at the DeYoung. So the piece has a home now. Um, you know, you can see that I used a smaller scale bullet, you know, for the mm -hmm. final piece to really make it read more legibly in that sense. Um, I did have a friend who was um, a computer engineer who looked at this work and said, wow, you're making binary code. And I was like, I guess I am, you know, and I never really thought of it that way. Um, but I, I really am using this work, I hope to show the magnitude of the problem mm -hmm. because a lot of times in the news, we hear, you know, the names, like some of the names you called, Ahmad or Brianna or George, you know, and we hear these names, you know, and I could call names from New York City back in the Schomburg days, Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Stewart, you know, I mean, we can call certain names uh, and honor them, but it's important to see 214 mm -hmm. Black men in one year alone. That's yeah. a lot of men, you know. 
Um, and so, you know, in transitioning to the work I've been doing on this residency, you know, I looked it up because I wanted to be able to discuss it today. So as of today in 2020, 985 people have been killed by the police in America. Wow. And, you know, that's across all races, all genders, but 985 people as of December 29th. And I actually um, use a data set from the Washington Post, mm -hmm. and they started tracking this in 2015. And so at this point, according to their records, 5,902 people have been killed by the police since 2015. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because if, you know, if that number reflected how many people had been killed by the common cold, say, or um, similar to the way we're thinking about the number of people who died during the pandemic, we would call it, we, as we do, we would call it a pandemic. We would call it an epidemic of, of violence, of, of racism, or, or of police brutality. It's very, um, and curiously, we don't really we don't a few people do but we don't really largely collectively address it as such that's right you know and so i'm really just using my work as a vehicle to talk about like how widespread this problem is you mm -hmm. know because i think like most things we get into this narrative about oh, it could be one bad apple or it could be two bad apples. 5,000 bad apples. 5,902 bad apples, you know, or over. Or <laughs> yeah. Tank. You gotta that's burn it lot, down. Yeah, that's a lot of bad apples, you know. And when you sort of look at, you know, the language around it all, I mean, you know, this whole notion of protect and serve, well, who are you protecting and serving? Because this many people are dying on a regular basis at the hands of police violence. Um, and so one of the things, you know, when I dive into this work is that I start to see it really is every state, you know? And so the work I've been doing here, I've been looking at 2019 data and starting to map that out. And literally every state except, let's see, Rhode Island did not have a police killing in 2019 that we know of yet, and neither did North Dakota. Hmm. But every other state and the District of Columbia had a police killing in 2019. So it's not even like we could say, oh, this is a big city problem. Right. <laughs> no, it's a nationwide problem. It's a nationwide problem. And so for the piece that you're working on in your studio, um, mm -hmm. the final presentation of it, or you know, the, the life it'll take on after it leaves the studio is, are you intending to, you said you were, you were excited about having the walls because of scale. Is this the scale that it'll stay at? Or are you going to expand it? Is this basically, is this similar to like the first, um, not draft, but the first kind of iteration of it and then where, what, how is it going to live outside of, outside of this residency? I'm curious. Yeah. So I think, you know, at some point I see this as a body of work that could be a solo show somewhere. Um, I think what I'm seeing in my mind is actually one quilted piece per year that the data is available. So, you know, I would say this residency is a first step in thinking through those ideas, but actually building the work is going to take a long time. Um, and I can actually, I think I can show it a little closer if I hold it up. But like, you know, this scale mm -hmm. is actually um, like eight foot by 10 foot. And so each individual square is eight by 10 and um, I'll get a little closer. And so this work on the wall, you know, in terms of process, one of the things I do is start as cheaply as possible, you know, when I'm figuring out the idea. And so this is just like, 
regular paper that you run through your printer. And these are not actually to scale. These are a little smaller than eight by 10 each. Mm -hmm. But I also just started printing out, which I can show you on the desk. So this stack near my water bottle, those are actually to scale. So uh, when cropped, each one would be an eight by 10 inch square. And, you know, I think that's the part that has been interesting in terms of like just figuring out that scale. So, you know, I always say making the work teaches me what I know about the work. And so like, here's a draft. This is Kansas. Kansas was like the hard state. Wow. Kansas, yeah, Kansas has actually the number nine. They had nine killings. So, you know, it became just its own little math puzzle of figuring out what size gun I could use, what the spacing might be for nine across on this panel, because nine is about all you can get mm -hmm. on that eight by 10 format, you know? And, and then thinking through the format, I don't know who might want their state, but I did sort of want modular units that like, if somebody said, I would like to buy my, my state and have that, I would say, okay. And I could make them an eight by 10 that they could right. easily put in a frame. But the final work will be one big, um, you know, one big quilt mm -hmm. that I plan to sew together. And it will be, um, it will be much, I would say a nicer quality paper, you know? I, I mean, I've just started ordering some sample papers that might be the right weight to hold it up. Yeah. It, the monumentality of both of these pieces seem incredibly important and being able to, as a viewer, walk up to it and kind of see your body in relation to, to what you're looking at, to the horror that you're looking at. Um, and yeah, I just, that's going, it's going to be a very striking piece. I Thank can you. say just, um, I mean, I, I haven't, but I was not able to see um, the show to be young though. Hopefully it will be, I mean, hopefully whenever we're allowed to go to museums, yes. again, hopefully it'll still be on view. Um, but just, yeah, just, I, just looking at the images, um, it's immediate, it's already so striking. I can only imagine what it's kind of like to experience in person. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hope that, I mean, originally the show was to be up till January 3rd. And so hopefully it can be yeah, extended exactly. um, depending on, you know, everybody's calendar has gotten completely jammed up. And I know this. it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. That was so. yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I think that to me, I mean, this work, I think is the, the fun part of being an artist is that, you know, you have time to figure out ideas. It's not like there's any rush to figure out the idea, you know? And mm -hmm. so I think that's the real joy mm -hmm. of having the space of residencies, you know, and why it's so mm -hmm. great that this will take time, made a new residency in Oakland. It's why, I mean, the French consulate built property, which is unprecedented, you know? And yeah. then they like went forward with it in a pandemic. So, yeah. you know, the amount of like time and space that a residency gives you mm -hmm. as an artist to say, okay, I, there's this idea I've had for a long time. I want to like mm -hmm. revisit it, you know? Cause these pieces, um, the De Young piece was in 2018 that I made it. And then I had made a companion wall map of data that showed everybody in the country. And that was a three foot by four foot piece. And so even though it was still a good size wall map, it just sort of sat with me like, I don't think it's reading as well as I would like it to. So I think this quilt, as yeah. I call it, you know, eight foot by 10 foot is going to do it. Yeah. Well, I want to transition now to talking about one of your other uh, mediums, 
Um, so I want to take some time to talk about your glasswork a little yeah. bit. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk, you know, just share with us a little bit about how you kind of first came to working with glass um, and why it's been such a generative medium for you. Mm -hmm. So I came to glass actually in around 2000. Um, I had been taking some art classes after work in DC at, um, there used to be a museum in DC, the Corcoran Museum and Corcoran. yes, and the Corcoran um, had, a, they had, um, I think they had undergrad and master's programs, but they had a really big continuing education program. So I was taking um, a certificate in ceramics and sculpture when I sort of started figuring out that I was interested in visual art. And at the conclusion of that, a glass school opened, the Washington Glass School, mm -hmm. um, set up by Tim Tate, Erwin Timmers, and then their third partner came on board, Michael Janis. And so I just said, well, if I can make a clay bowl, surely I can make a glass bowl. And there was never such a humbling experience. That's <laughs> <laughs> that first glass class, yes. Everyone else had finished two bowls and I barely finished one bowl in four weekends. And I was like, what is this medium? And when um, that class was over, I signed up for another workshop that was on glass and light. And they said, what do you want to make? And I said, I wanted to make a lighted sculpture about world poverty. And they were like, you're an interesting person. And I was <laughs> like, yeah. And as it turned out, there was a Washington Post reporter embedded in the class. So she followed me and one of the owners around as I learned how to make this glass sculpture. Um, and then when I showed the piece, you know, it was written up again in the post by the art critic and the owner of the studio who was the glass artist, as opposed to the other owners who was more metalsmith and lighting said, you know, I think you got a future, you should try and settle down. And I was like, okay. And so he encouraged me to go deeper in my craft. And I went to the Penland School of Crafts in mm. North Carolina for the first time in 2003 and studied with um, equally, some would say most famous DC glass artist, um, the great Thurman Statham, mm. who is also a black glass artist. And so out of that experience, and continuing to practice at when I came back home at Washington Glass, I just realized it was a medium that I really enjoyed working with. Glass has always fascinated me. Um, so, because so one of my other the me, one of the other mediums that I'm most passionate about is photography, and glass has always mm -hmm. struck me as being similar in that it's due to its materiality, it's it's associated with a sort of lightness and a sort of like transparency and, um, and an objectivity. You can literally see through it. You can see you know, what it is in a certain way, but it's also a medium that obscures a lot. Mm -hmm. that's, it, that's also about obscuring. And, and I was just wondering, I guess, like thinking about, especially the process of creating it, like the labor process is, I think I'm very removed from how like glass is even created in the first place or blown or manipulated. Mm -hmm. And so, just thinking about the work that you that you do conceptually as well is that something that you have tried to marry with the material that you use um, glass is being mm -hmm. something that allows us theoretically allows us to see but also distorts and thinking about the way that you use data and history and facts conceptually in the work that you do yeah i definitely i mean i think i approach my glass practice the same way I approached the work on paper. And since the work on paper came later, you know, in mm -hmm. my career, I would say totally um, the same in that I am very driven by text and the people I studied with were really people who were driven by narrative as well. You know, when you look at, yes, that's me in my studio and you see show a couple more photos. Yeah, yeah. all the screens, cause I do screen either um, screen printing onto the glass or powder printing. So mm -hmm. still through the screen. Um, and for people, when I use those terms, I'm really just referring to how fine the glass powder is browned. And so, mm -hmm screen printing with enamels is using really, really like talcum powder consistent 
glass mixed with a medium to flow like ink versus powder printing, which is a little coarser that I literally just sprinkle through the screen to get the image. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the text is where it begins for me. And a lot of times, you know, a thought will come to me and I'll just put it in the sketchbook and let it sit for a while. Um, I think my show at Moad, you know, was the first time that I showed a lot of work on paper, you know, because I think part of the challenge when someone says, okay, you can have a solo show and you're like, I can have a solo show. And then I'm like, I don't have 25 pieces. What are we talking about? You know, so <laughs> that, that tie in of sort of figuring out like what will show best in the glass. So sometimes portraiture to your point about photography shows really well in glass, it's a wonderful medium for that. Um, other times I would say that there is a certain amount of abstraction. You know, I don't work as abstractly with glass, but I certainly value abstract art that I've seen translated into glass. But there's so much, you know, so much of the roots of glass are in story, even when you go back to like the stained glass of the cathedrals. And so, yeah, the, you know, the pictures on the screen, I had the good fortune of getting a kiln a couple of years ago through a Kickstarter campaign. And so, you know, that has been a learning curve as well, like how to, you know, care and feed an 1100 pound piece of equipment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to stop sharing briefly, mm -hmm. just open it up to see if there are any questions. Great. Thank you. Okay. There are no one in the chat just yet, but I have a couple more anyway. So I will ask. Uh, so I, one of the things that I'm interested in, obviously, is um, is basically thinking about how, like your work, how your work specifically looks at how narrative is constructed um, and how stories are kind of told, how history is made in a sense. And I think we all know, we're all very aware that we're kind of living through this very unprecedented historic moment in time. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see either through your extensive research and your extensive looking at um, at this data that you've been acquiring, how narratives right now are being structured, and whether you think that you know, with everything being so publicly and digitally available to us all the time, whether or not we are being more careful in the way we are kind of approaching history making and play, or whether you think we're being possibly more careless in the way that we are approaching history making right now. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are and what this time will look like visually um, in your work or anyone else's um, further down the road. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that I would describe it as, I think we're being more truthful. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I think this is a time of greater authenticity. And so I think that's a really good thing, you know? Um, I think that it's kind of what we talked about before um, in terms of the actual, um, like your cat ran by, you know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> Zoom life is a place right. of great authenticity. And so, you know, I, I actually am very heartened by that. And I think that, you know, we'll look back on this and say, gee, people were actually you know, writing things very much from the heart and from a place of authenticity. They were drawing their experience very much from the heart and from their authenticity. Um, and I think that, you know, to tie back to the De Young show, mm -hmm. you know, there's a whole room that's devoted to people and how they've been processing the pandemic and seeing that sort of um, come to light. One of the pieces, you know, when you were sharing my work that you flipped through that sort of showed a vignette of a bedroom, you know, was kind of my own take on the pandemic journals. Um, the New York Times has been doing like a regular feature with artists 
sharing their journals. Um, I certainly have friends that are doing journals, including, you know, one of the people on this call um, is doing a fantastic plague journal every day on Instagram, Lisa Beth Robinson. So if you're not following her, follow her. Um, you know, and so my own take on the plague journal was this sort of like collage of, um, again, a historical text, Mrs. Beaton's Guide to Household Management, which is a very, you know, stuffy middle-class British look at how one should run a household. Um, of course, buried in the subtext is how to manage the servants. And that actually takes up most of the book from the 1800s. Um, and then this backdrop of a journal that's actually a Civil War journal by mm -hmm. Clara Barton, because I also feel like there's a lot of pressure right now, particularly on female identified people to be, you know, keeping the home while at the same time running society and doing all these things. So I do feel like when we look back on this time in art making, it will be a more authentic time, a more narrative journal time than perhaps we've seen in a while. Wow, thank you. So we have a couple questions. So the first one is um, from Carol Seisherman. Um, could Cheryl talk about the large glass piece that we saw? Oh, so that was not one glass piece. That was actually like 80 individual glass pieces. So those were individual glass tiles in my kiln that were being fired. Mm -hmm. What was uh, what, what was the final kind of configuration? Oh yeah, the final each piece is actually um, powder printed with an image of um, Africa on it. So yeah, it was like individual tiles. And so part of like getting a kiln that big is the hope that I will grow into mm. one large piece. <laughs> yeah. Kind of similar to what you're doing with the paper. Like eventually it'll all coalesce into one large quilt. I don't know exactly. if it's out of glass, but. Yes. <laughs> well, and you know, I mean, I think the dream too, I'll turn the light back up is to also have, um, you know, when you have one big piece of glass like that, you also have a nice friend to help you lift that big piece of glass out of the kiln too. Cause you know, right. <laughs> yes. All right. The next question is Cheryl, when you're creating a piece of art, do you have a specific audience in mind? Is it part of your personal processing of the material or text or more piece of activism? Um, I would say neither one. I don't necessarily have a specific audience in mind and I don't necessarily create work because I think it's activist work. You know, I always say my work has a social commentary bent to it. I think this police brutality work is probably the most straight ahead work that has activism at its core. Um, but a lot of my other work you know, always dealt with sort of economic issues or environmental issues, but I don't think it specifically had the same type of call to action that the police brutality work has. Um, and, you know, I always say that I make work for people who are art collectors or don't know they're art collectors yet. That's who I make work for. Are there, uh even if you don't make uh, work for specific audiences, are there, do you, are there people, especially with thinking about like the work around police brutality, are there specific audiences that you at least hope will be in, um, will be in conversation with the work at the mm -hmm. very least, like maybe not making it for them, but mm -hmm. I just think about the numbers of people who go to galleries or museums, not expecting to have to engage with real, you know, mm -hmm society or social issues in a certain way. And then suddenly they're confronted with it and they're having this very different kind of experience and different conversation. And I was just wondering if that's something that you hope to get out of presenting, you know, work that is that charged and that is that kind of not confrontational, but challenging in a certain way mm -hmm. um, in those kinds of spaces. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, I didn't set out to make work specifically for museums 
But I can honestly say over the course of my career, I am a museum artist. There's a lot about my work that really works well in museums. And I've been fortunate to show in a lot of really great museums. And I think that museums are uniquely situated to allow people to have that type of interaction with more challenging work in a safe space. Um, and so I do think in that sense, even if I didn't set out initially to say, oh, I'm gonna create work because I wanna be a museum artist. I think that museums are uniquely positioned and interested in narrative content and storytelling, um, unlike, you know, some other spaces, maybe. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would say we try to encourage it, you know, whether or not yeah. we meet that expectation, it is encouraged in that space. Mm -hmm. Totally. Are there any, you know, outside of, we've, you know, we've looked at, we've talked about the glass work, we've talked about paper, your works on paper, um, you previously had a background with ceramics, it sounded like. Are there any mediums that you haven't gotten a chance to work with yet that you're excited about in the future? Or that you would, if you, you know, I don't know if you found yourself in a different residency space that allowed you the opportunity to play and experiment with something you haven't previously taken on. Is there anything that you, that's like on your dream list of materials or mediums? You know, that's a great question. I don't think so. I mean, I think I'm in a place right now where I'm much more interested in scale mm -hmm. and scaling up my work, you know? So I think that like, you know, I could answer that question by saying like, my dream residency is Kohler. The day I get to go away to Kohler and be in that big factory and make all the big work, I will be a happy camper, you know? Um, I actually feel like I could spend the rest of my life in glass and in paper and just begin to scratch the surface of all of it. Um, because, you know, as we touched on a little earlier and you kind of picked up on, I mean, there's so much about my work that's analog and I really enjoy that, you know? So it's like the Photoshop stuff or the research stuff is like the 20% that's gonna get us to the hand. And I like the evidence of the hand. And so I think that's why I'm a person who really values craft, you know, I value glass, I value paper, including handmade paper. Mm -hmm. um, the past few years, I've started learning how to make books and artist books, you know, so I, I enjoy. I mean, sewing for me. I know that uh, Rodney Ewing is also making has been making his own paper recently. And you two oh, really yeah, you two are in the same collective. I was just wondering if there's, if 3.9 is going to come out with a big, big artist book anytime soon of handmade paper. Do you ever work collectively okay. with the, or work on projects with the other collective members? You know, we haven't done that yet. We have done shows together, mm -hmm. but we have worked, you know, on a piece together. Um, but I find that really interesting. I know that Rodney has been doing um, the collab veterans residency. So mm -hmm. it does surprise me that a part of that is also paper making, you know, cause they're just such a wonderful print and paper facility. Um, and I do know that he actually did a similar sort of collaboration with um, Tahiti Pearson recently, yeah. mm -hmm. where, you know, Tahiti was making, yeah, this paper that, you know, he finally carves and mm -hmm. sculpts and cuts. And then Rodney put the print over that. Um, you know, we're just starting now to think about what 2021 might look like for 3.9. So it will be interesting to see if more collaborative projects come out of that. But right now, traditionally, the way we approach that is through shows and mm -hmm. then opportunities for other collective members, whether it's, you know, curators or writers or whoever to have, you know, that built into whatever creative project we're working on. Well, so, I mean, I think that's a good 
segue into my final final question for for the hour, which is, do you have anything that you'd like to plug? I always like to leave artists the opportunity um, to let us know what what you have coming up, what you have, what you're working on, where people can uh, see your work next. So if you have any shows or panels, talks or anything coming up. Well, thank you. Um, let me say that if all goes well in 20. Oh, that was the worst time to cut out. Oh, and it also looks like we have questions in the Q&A. Sorry. Uh-oh, uh though. <laughs> I didn't get the notification that there were things in the Q&A box for some reason. I don't know if she's going to come back. I don't know if she's going to come back either. Shoot. Nope. Oh. Um, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we, we lost Cheryl at the end, but we had a great, I feel like we had a really great uh, conversation up into, oh, she's back, she's back. Possibly. Hi, I got you back. Okay, good. I was like, let me move to another position in the studio <laughs> for the Wi-Fi. Well, apparently we actually, so I did not get the notification that there were questions in the Q&A. So I apologize that we didn't get to, oh. to these mm -hmm. questions, but I will, I, will, I will at least get to one of them, I suppose, just to, cause I feel bad that I've asked oh, most. Sure, of them. yeah, but, um, no, please. Mm -hmm. I don't mind hanging out if you wanna hang hang out a minute. It's totally fine. Um, so I will, I'll just ask one more question and then uh, we can, we can hop off. Um, so this one is, because I'm also very curious about this as well, is mm -hmm. can you talk about representation in the world of glass artists? It seems there are very, there are a few glass artists of color. And I've also been interested in, I guess, in how many, and you had mentioned there's a great uh, black glass artist that you had been um, inspired by. And so I'm curious as to what that's like for artists of color in the glass world. Mm -hmm. um, it is a smaller community. It's a growing community. You know, I would say that first of all, glass is also traditionally a very male field. And so, you know, specifically like black glass artists that are very well known, Thurman Statum, S-T-A-T-O-M is, you know, the father of it all. Um, and then people like Nate Watson at Public Glass, who's their director, um, who trained in glass and is a glass blower. Um, Corey Pemberton, who's one of the co-founders of Craft in the Future, is another black glass artist. Um, there are certainly people who have had residencies in glass and done amazing work, even though it wasn't their primary medium. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking about our own Mildred Howard, yeah. who had the Tacoma Museum mm -hmm. residency and made amazing glass work. Um, also Joyce Scott, who just got the award from American Craft Council is someone, um, she's worked with Baringo Studios in Venice. Um, Shay Rhodes is a master glass blower who took over the program in Louisville. So, you know, they're not enough by any stretch of the imagination, um, glass artists of color, but there are a number of people doing really great work. Um, Preston Singletary is a Native American artist up in the Southwest who does gorgeous glass work. So I would encourage people, you know, to check out any of those folks, but, you know, um, I took a lot of heart, you know, from actually a show that Joyce Scott curated several, well, many years ago, but it was called Stop Asking We Exist, 25 African-American Craft Artists. And, you know, I, in seeing that as a person who was just sort of coming to her craft, I was like, oh, look, you know, here are these people that look like me, you know, and it had people with all the names, you know, like Martin Purrier and Thurman. Right. And so, yeah, people are here. Well, that's fantastic. That's also a great note to end on, I think. Um, so thank you. I just want to thank you again, Cheryl, for being in conversation with me today. 
it's always great to have you part of part of Moad. Um, oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I love being with the Moad family. I want to thank everyone who came today, both on Zoom and Facebook. Thanks for putting up with like Wi-Fi in the shipping container. But yeah, it's, it's authentic. We talked about yeah. it. It's authentic. <laughs> Zoom yeah. one. Yeah, I don't even have Wi-Fi in my glass studio. So it was really great that this happened at a time where there was Wi-Fi in the studio. So thank you so much. Um, I will, I will, there's one last question, but you guys can chat offline from Maria Eleonora Bailey, who asked, what is your advice for someone who wants to get started as a black artist? I think the two of you should definitely connect. Um, we'll look for all of Cheryl's contact information um, outside of the talk today. Um, thank you again, Cheryl. And thank you everyone who watched the talk. If you um, wanna watch it again later or tell your friends about it, um, it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, later today, later this week. Um, yeah, it was great. Thank you so much, Elena, and have a happy new year. Yes. Cheers to 2021. Cheers to, cheers to 2021.